if you want to test if your model fits the data, then the chi-square test is the appropriate way of doing so in structural ecosystem models. However, the chi-square test is not the only way of evaluating model fit. Let's take an example of these. Uh, let's take a look at these two examples from published research. And these are fairly common in papers that apply SCM. So you see these tables that list the chi-square first, but then are all these other indices. There is CFI, there is RMSEA, and then there are others. So there are many, many indices, and then supposedly they tell us about something about model fit. Let's take a look at what is the argument for these indices and uh, what is the idea behind the indices. The argument for these indices is not actually an argument for the indices as much. It's an argument against the chi-square. And the argument goes like this. So every model is wrong even before it is fitted to the data. And this means that, for example, if we model relationship between x and y as linear, very few relationships are actually exactly linear in the day in any real data set. Another example, if we have a, a measurement scale consisting of five agreement items, we assume that the measurement errors of those items are exactly uncorrelated. There are many reasons to believe that they are not exactly uncorrelated. The correlations may be low, but they're not exactly zero. If we have a large enough sample size, then this kind of small discrepancies will be detected by the chi-square. And uh, the argument further goes that instead of testing if the model fits the data exactly, we are more interested in the decree of misfit of the model. So the chi-square tells that the model is not exactly correct, but we want to understand whether it is uh, incorrect in a way that causes problems for our inference. So this is the argument against the chi-square, an argument for the alternative fit indices. And this argument is actually made in one of these papers. So in Ulrenga's paper, uh, in the footnote for the table, they say that the chi-square is sensitive uh, in large sample sizes, therefore it can be completely ignored, which they do in the study. And then they look at these, these other indices. But this is, a, this is a highly problematic statement because the same statement can be made in the context of any statistical test. So if you run a regression analysis, if your sample size is large enough, then uh, the normal test for significance will detect trivially small differences between the coefficients and zero, and therefore the p-value should not be trusted. But I have not seen a single article that makes this kind of argument that uh, the chi-square should not be trusted because it has too much power, but then they would uh, notice that it's the same problem for regression analysis. So there is uh, this kind of tendency that when you see evidence against your model like we have here, we disregard it. When you see evidence that uh, supports your theoretical argument, even if the same logic that is applied here would lead to the, uh, discarding that test as well, it's nevertheless not done. So there is some, some uh, cherry picking of evidence that is fairly common. Okay, so, so what are these indices then? So, so what do the indices tell us? And they are referred to as alternative fit indices and they fall into two families or two, uh, most of the indices fall into two families. The first index is uh, set as our descriptive indices. So descriptive indices quantify the degree of, of misfit and uh, RMSCA and uh, SRMR are the two most commonly used ones. The uh, interpretation of RMSCA is a bit more complicated, so I'll just focus on uh, uh, SRMR. And SRMR is basically what is the average residual covariance in the residual covariance matrix. So it's a geometric mean, but um, basically an average. And if the average degree of, of residuals is small, then we conclude that the model fits okay. Of course, as I explained in the video about the chi-square test, if you have a small average, it does not mean that all the residual covariances are small. It is possible that there is an area with large covariances that you should do something about it. But if you just look at the mean, then uh, those misspecifications go undetected. The rules of thumb 
that you can find in many different sources and you can find multiple different rules of thumbs. But the, I think this is the most lenient one goes that are it should be below 0.8 or another more strict guideline is that it should be below 0.5 and the confidence interval should be below 0.8 but then you can find these uh, guidelines that also say that uh, 0.1 is sometimes acceptable just mediocre fit. The other family of fit indices are comparative fit indices. So we uh, calculate alternative models. So we calculate our, our hypothesized model. So that is the one that gives us the chi-square. Then we calculate two alternative models. We have the null model. The null model is a model that should not fit the data at all. And typically the null model that we use is a model where we say that the variables have variances that are estimated but they are constrained to be uncorrelated. And quite often what we study, we study measures that are supposed to measure the same thing and we study phenomena that are related so the indicators are actually highly correlated and then forcing a model that says that the indicators are don't correlate at all will fit really badly. And then we have uh, on the other extreme we have model that fits perfectly the saturated model we basically allow all covariances between the indicators to be freely estimated and uh, then these indices quantify how far from the worst possible model toward the best possible model we are on, on some metric of model fit. So for example uh, the CFI of 0.95 could be interpreted that as if we start from the worst possible model then go toward the best possible mo fitting model then we are 95% of the way. And the interpretation of, of TLI is similar that just quantify the uh, degree of misfit a bit differently. The rules of thumb, the original rule of thumb for CFI was 0.95 but then you can see these uh, rules of thumb that say that sometimes 0.85 is okay, 0.9 is already uh, acceptable fit and the original rule of thumb was 0.95. If you are below that, then you have problems. These have conceptual problems. And, and the big conceptual problem can be understood with an example. So, so let's say that uh, I, I, I like running and let's say that I, from if I compare myself to the best marathon runner in the world, that is the, uh, the, the saturated model, and the worst possible marathon runner in the world, that is the saturated model, I'm 95% of the way toward the best possible runner. So, so how, do we, how do we make come up with that kind of comparison? Well, you can just choose a person who's really bad at running. For example, you can choose a person without legs as your reference point and that person definitely cannot run a marathon. And then you can claim that, uh, that you're a good runner because you run a marathon uh, in a uh, less than uh, one hour slower than the worst best marathon, which is still a large difference. So, but the fact that someone takes a uh, hundred hours for a marathon does not make you a good marathon runner if you are like in the four hour or something range compared to the two hours, which is the world record. So this is an, a bit of an unfair or illogical comparison because we are using a model that should not fit the data at all. So why would it make make a difference if our model fits better than model that should not work at all. So that's the argument against the CFI and also the TLI or, or any other index that uses this principle of comparing against the worst possible model. And uh, when you read about these indices you can find all kinds of tables from, from books that list these uh, cutoffs that you can apply and there are not many other indices as well. So uh, the uh, model evaluation basically reduces to uh, finding the right index, finding the right cutoff and finding the right book to recommend the cutoff that you want to apply. This is of course, this is not a good research practice. So let's take a look at, at how the chi-square test should uh, be used and let's take a look at two extremes. So the argument for these alternative indices was basically simply an argument against the chi-square. So there are two extremes in this argument in chi-square. One is that models with significant chi-square are wrong and should not be published or trusted. And the other end of the argument is that chi-square can be completely disregarded and does not need to be reported. So both of these uh, 
and, and this argument would further continue that you evaluate the model based on these alternative fit indices and uh, descriptive fit indices. Both of these arguments have problems. So this argument has the problem that all multiple indicator measures, so if we have a scale, measurement scale, then uh, basically they would be rejected if the sample size is large enough because it is unrealistic that if a person responds to survey questions then the measurement errors of every question with every other question are going to be exactly zero. No one can design that kind of survey and it would also uh, we would have to uh, eliminate all item context effects and so on. The second problem is that we lose information from models that they're trivially misspecified. So it is possible that some of the, uh, the residual covariances are 0.01 and they are not zero. So chi-square will eventually detect them, but they may not be large enough to make the model results completely untrustworthy. So that is the, uh, the one extreme perspective. The other extreme perspective, which is actually very common, much more common than this extreme, is that chi-square can be completely disregarded like uh, in the Uderenko paper and uh, but the problem with this article this perspective is that the, the chi-square detects trivial misspecifications in large samples that is true but it does not imply that a significant chi-square means that the misspecification is trivial. Also severe misspecified models are likely to be accepted if we don't respect the model test, then uh, we are going to be accepting models that have serious local misspecifications in one part of the model that are nevertheless not reflected in the indices that just quantify the average misspecification. And finally, it is not clear if the, uh, the alternative fit indices will actually help in detecting model misspecifications. There is mixed evidence uh, of whether these models, these indices work or not. We know for sure that they will not work always. There may be scenarios where they work and then the problem is that how would you know if your study is done in a scenario where for example the CFI 0.95 rule is uh, going to be is, is guaranteed to produce only results that are trivially specified. So a more reasonable perspective is somewhere in the middle. And the more reasonable position would take uh, the chi-square and respect it. So if our model is not exactly correct for the data, we report that and we say that the model can be misspecified or is misspecified in some way. And then the results may be a bit less trustworthy than we would hope them to be. Then we need to do diagnostics to understand the misspecifications understand the source of misfit and when we understand the source of misfit then we can probably fix the model. So it's fairly common that when you look at models presented in the papers there are constraints that don't make sense. For example you constrain uh, two explanatory variables, two exogenous variables to be uncorrelated. Those are almost certainly simply model specification errors and not intentional and they just go undetected because people don't do misspecifications. Once you understand the source of misspecification and whether you can do something about it, then the next thing is that you do a sensitivity analysis. So if you don't know if your model, if you don't have any theoretical reason to modify your model based on the diagnostics, then you can free it, free some of the parameters empirically. Your statistical software will do provide you something called modification indices and you can just check how much changing your model a little here and there would influence the results. If changing the model here and there a little would not change the results by much, then we can conclude that the possible misspecifications in the model probably will not have a major result impact on our results. And importantly, the alternative fit indices are not needed in this uh, more reasonable process. So there are different arguments and for and against these alternate fit indices. Klein summarizes these, assumptions, these arguments really well in his book in chapter 8 and he concludes that uh, there is enough evidence to show that these alternate fit indices don't detect all serious model misspecifications. So it is possible that you have severely misspecified model and CFI is still above 0.95 
and therefore if CFI is more than 0 0.95 it does not mean that we wouldn't have a serious misspecification. And his position is close to mine. Uh, the the chi-square provides you useful information. If it does not reject the model then we know that the covariance fit is very good. If it does then we need to do diagnostics and uh, understand the source of misspecification. One final thing about these indices that is worth mentioning is the understanding where do they come from. So who presented the first alternative fit index and why? Well it was Carl Jerskuk who uh, developed LISRA which was the first structural ecosystem modeling software and the first alternative fit index was the GFI index. And he said that that was developed because users were unhappy that Lisrael rejected their models with the chi-score test and then he wanted to provide the users something else otherwise the users would drop stop using the software and, and do use software that doesn't do model testing. So this is the history. These were invented to make users happy not really to uh, be good yardsticks on whether models are good or not. So conclusions about model fit. The chi-square is the only test of model fit. If you want to test if the model is correct for the data then chi-square does that job for you. The other indices quantify the degree of average misspecification in the model. The problem is that the average misspecification, the average covariance misfit hides lots of individual covariances and those individual covariances can indicate problems that are serious or problems that can be addressed and just looking at the average will hide these problems. So these indices are not helpful in doing diagnostics for models. Nevertheless they can be reported because it's a convention and often the reviewers will ask you to report the indices if you just do chi-square. So maybe it's a good practice to always have CFI, RMSI, RMSEA and maybe SRMR in your paper. Finally, if the model does not fit the data, it is important to do diagnostics of the residuals or potentially modification indices to understand where is the source of misfitting.